This evening we're returning to Psalm 119. As you know, the theme of Psalm 119 is the law of God, which is why we've been looking at the law so much through this. But again, that's not something that, um, well, that we should find in, in any way distasteful. Sadly, there are those who profess faith in Christ who do find it to be a distasteful thing. But it's only, I think, well, it can be from one of two reasons. Either they're unconverted and they don't see, you know, the, the grace of God. They don't see uh, the, the beauty of holiness. Or they're just simply misinformed and have been taught to look at the law as something bad. But we need to see that it is something that is good because it reflects the holiness of God and shows us how we might love Him and how we might love others. And in doing that, might receive His blessings. So let's uh, consider another portion of this psalm this evening, Psalm 119, verses 121 through 128. Let me read that as we begin. And again, notice the emphasis on obedience here and how the psalmist viewed God's law. He says, I have done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Be surety for your servant, for good. Do not let the arrogant oppress me. My eyes fail with longing for your salvation and for your righteous word. Deal with your servant according to your loving kindness and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for the Lord to act, for they have broken your law. Therefore, I love your commandments above gold. Yes, above fine, above fine gold. Therefore, I esteem right all your precepts concerning everything. I hate every false way. Again, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, again... Um, We've, been see, well, we've seen that knowing Jesus Christ means to become like Jesus Christ. And if you're becoming like Jesus Christ, that means that you will have a concern for the lost. Being concerned for the lost means that you're going to try to reach out to them with the gospel in order to save them. But reaching out to them with the gospel means you're going to run the risk of suffering for it. Now, this morning, we considered that... To break through that particular barrier of suffering or being afraid of suffering, we need to look at suffering differently than we do. Suffering, remember, is the norm. That's what the Lord calls us to do, which is why we have to be willing to suffer before we would follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means, at least one of the things, to pick up His cross. But since it is the norm, when you suffer for doing what's right, it's also the Lord's mark of ownership on you. It shows that you actually belong to Him because you're willing to do what is right enough to draw the attention of the world actually to attack you. Suffering, we saw, is how the Lord trains you, how He prepares to use you. This is how He prepared His Son, how He prepared Him to do the work that Jesus is now doing in heaven as He intercedes for us as our sympathetic high priest. I mean, he's gone through everything we could possibly go through because he suffered in the flesh. He suffered as a man on this earth, and so he can serve as our high priest. Suffering we also saw as a privilege. Uh, suffering is something that all the children of God have to endure to one degree or another, but it's a privilege to suffer greatly for the Lord because God won't just let any of His children suffer to that degree, but those that He intends to use even more for His glory. Those who are used most powerfully by the Lord are the ones who suffered the most. I'm not sure if there's an exception to that. And, of course, suffering is rewardable. The more you suffer, the greater your reward will be. So if you reach out with the gospel, if you really get serious about serving the Lord in this way, in the greatest work that He gives you to do, you're going to suffer but you do need to see that that is a good thing and not a bad thing. But again, let's not forget what we saw last week, and that's something we're going to be looking at a little more this evening, that when you set out to share the gospel, when you set out to do God's work in this way, He isn't going to leave you on your own. 
He is going to be there for you. He has made a promise to you that He is going to protect you, that He is going to sustain you. He also is not going to put you through anything that He won't also give you the strength to endure. And He will do this for you as we see in Scripture because you are willing to obey Him. Now, again, we need to understand that there's a very real sense in which God's blessings, and, and really His blessings are precious, His blessings are what we need to live and to be happy in this world. His blessings depend on your obedience. As we see again in our passage this evening, you know, as, as He pleads His obedience as to why the Lord should free Him from oppression. Now, this, we see this emphasis again and again, particularly in the Old Testament, but it's also in the New Testament, and because of that, there have been many in the church, especially among dispensationalists, and that should maybe perk up some ears among some of you, to believe that, that God actually saved His people on the basis of obedience in the Old Covenant, that it was on the basis of their works that they were justified. And there are others who've modified that through the years to say, well, it was a challenge that was put out for them, that God, you know, gave them this challenge, but it's really only been through grace, uh, by grace through faith alone, and that is the case. But there have been those who actually said Old Testament saints were saved by their works. Thankfully, that has been largely rejected, but again, it just shows us the emphasis that's there on obedience and the connection to God's blessings. Now, the fact that He gives certain of His blessings when you obey Him simply means what the Reformers also said, that salvation or justification is by grace through faith alone, but that faith is never alone. True saving faith, true justifying faith always has works. If you are genuinely saved, you have a changed nature. You're not the same person you were before. Now you want to honor the Lord because you love Him. Now you want to keep His law because you love that law. And what the, the Lord tells us is to the degree that you do keep it, to that degree God will bless you. That is what we call an incentive. An incentive the Lord holds out to you to encourage you to walk with Him more closely. There's also other incentives that the Lord gives us to help us walk more closely, and that is the, the rod if uh, we won't listen to His Word. And again, remembering that that, that doesn't, you know, that, that's God's love, that He would use the rod for that because when we aren't walking in His commandments, it means we're doing something that's dishonoring to Him and harmful to ourselves and to others. And we discipline our children when they do things like that, don't we? Well, God does the same for His children. That's a good thing. Well, we see this again this evening in our passage, blessings for obedience as the, psalm, the psalmist offers to the Lord several reasons why he should help him, why he should deliver him from his enemies, many of which having to do with his obedience that stem from his love for God's commandments. Now, we should see this also as so many reasons why the Lord should deliver us as we set our hearts to serve him in this world. And one thing I want you to note from this passage is that the psalmist is calling out to the Lord as one who is already suffering. As we saw this morning, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The psalmist is suffering persecution for the sake of righteousness. He's made himself a target of the enemy. The enemy is oppressing him. But the psalmist is pleading to the Lord that he would deliver him because he is his child as evidenced by his obedience. So in this persecution, he looks to the Lord and he trusts that God is going to help him. But why did he believe that the Lord was going to listen to him? And why should you? Well, it's because he obeyed. Again, look at verses 121 and 122. Psalmist writes, I have done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Be surety for your servant for good. Do not let the arrogant oppress me. Basically, he's saying, I've treated others fairly and justly. I've done what is right in your eyes, O Lord. I've listened to you. And now, Lord, please listen 
to me. Now you realize that if you're disobeying God, you really can't look to Him and expect Him to deliver you because if you don't listen to the Lord, basically He says He's not going to listen to you. Rather, you can expect Him, as I mentioned before, to discipline you. And how does God often discipline us? Except by bringing enemies <laughs> to oppress us. He often disciplined His own people, Israel, by sending four nations against them to attack them. That's why you see all that going on in Scripture. He warned them first. He told them that they were sinning. They were breaking His commandments. He told them they needed to repent, but when they didn't repent, He disciplined them. And He did that because He loved them. So you can't, you can't expect God's blessings, at least you know, the, the things we usually think of as blessings when you're disobeying God, but you can't expect the blessing of discipline. However, you can expect the blessings we think of as blessings if you obey. Now realize that the psalmist, that this opposition was coming against him not because he was disobeying God, this wasn't you know, discipline for disobedience, but he was suffering opposition because he obeyed, because he was doing what was right. And as we saw this morning, that is what the Lord tells us to expect when we do what is right. That's what Jesus experienced in His life. That's what His disciples experienced. That's what all of His people throughout the centuries who set their hearts to do the work of the kingdom experienced. And here we see it was the experience of the psalmist as well. When you do what is right, you're going to suffer for it. But when you do what's right and you suffer for it, you can also expect God to listen to you because you're doing what He calls you to do. When you cry out to Him, you can expect Him to hear just as the psalmist knew that God was going to listen to him. Now, notice in verse 122, He calls out to the Lord to be His surety, to be His guarantee, as it were. And that's what God will be to you. If you love Him, trust Him, and obey Him, He will be your guarantee. Guarantee of what? Guarantee of blessing, guarantee of safety. In other words, he's saying to the Lord, do good to me as you said that you would. Remove this oppression from me. Now, Jesus Christ basically gave us the same guarantee when he sent his disciples out into the world as he sends us out into the world to make disciples of all the nations. He said he would be with them. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And what he meant by that was not that, that he was sort of hovering over them to see what was going to happen and just to stand by and watch as, as the world oppressed them and injured them, but what he meant was that he would be there to bless them, to strengthen them, to give them success, and ultimately to guarantee their safety, which we know from the example of the reformers that we looked at in, in the movies doesn't always mean that we're, we're going to be untouched and unscathed in this world. Sometimes. We might uh, be injured to the point where we even die. But it does mean ultimately that they cannot harm us. When the Lord allows us to, to die for His sake, He takes us out of this world to a much better place. And once you're there, uh, you're not going to complain that you're not here, you see, because it's so much better there. As, as again we saw this morning, Paul says, to depart and to be with Christ is very much better. And we need to believe that. Jesus was there to help His disciples and, if need be, to take them to be with Him in glory. Now, this is what the Lord says He's going to do for you if you will put Him first, if you will obey Him. You just simply need to take obedience seriously and listen to what He has to say, and He will do all that He said He would do. And again, He's even so faithful that when we don't do what we're supposed to do, He'll do what is necessary to get us to do what we're supposed to do so that we will receive that blessing. But now, secondly, we're reminded in this psalm that His help that He promises when we do obey Him doesn't always come right away. Sometimes He makes us wait. Notice the psalmist writes in verse 123, My eyes fail with longing for your salvation and for your righteous word was tempted to think that what it meant was that the psalmist was weeping as he's waiting for the Lord to answer his prayer, but I think it has more the idea of the psalmist is, is, is you know, he's, he's praying 
and he's waiting and he's watching for deliverance. And he's been watching for such a long time that his eyes, as it were, are failing as he waits for God to fulfill his righteous word. You've done everything that the Lord calls you to do as best as you possibly can. You've looked to Him, you've trusted Him, but He doesn't answer right away. When that happens, you need to keep looking until the Lord does answer. The psalmist writes in Psalm 123 verse 2, Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until He is gracious to us. God doesn't always answer right away. Sometimes He makes us wait. And why does He make you wait? Well, sometimes He hides Himself to test your faith. Sometimes He, he makes you wait to increase your endurance. The Lord always has a good purpose behind what He does. He's stretching you, testing you, helping you to grow stronger. I mean, if God always came to your aid immediately whenever you were in difficulty and cried to Him, it would likely make you presume or presumptuous on the grace of God. It would weaken you rather than strengthen you. God wants you to trust Him. And of course, trust is strengthened when you don't see the answer to your prayers right away. His delay will strengthen the earnestness with which you pray because the longer it takes, the stronger you will pray and it will increase your patience. In other words, His waiting will make you grow spiritually. And that's a good thing. You know, it isn't always what we want, is it? It's not what we want to experience. We want immediate gratification. We want the Lord to deliver us right away. We don't want to go through difficult times. But the Lord sometimes allows us to be in the crucible longer so that we will grow. That's the reason behind it anyway. Suffering makes us more usable to the Lord. But let's not forget that the Lord's help will come, and it will come because of His mercy, because of His grace, because of really His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're reminded that it ultimately is not our obedience that brings the blessing. That's just the evidence that, you know, God, we are we're the Lord's and that we've received His mercies and His grace. Verse 124 reminds us of that because he doesn't say, deal with me according to my righteousness, O Lord, but he says, deal with your servant according to your loving kindness and teach me your statutes. His loving kindness is really what's behind your obedience in the first place, why you obey, why you can obey. Your obedience doesn't earn anything. Your obedience always falls short. Your obedience is just evidence that you belong to Him. His help He gives to you because of His loving kindness, because of His grace, because of His mercy, because you are His, because you're in covenant with Him, because you've trusted in His Son, you have faith in His Son. That's why He gives you His promises. That's why they're yours in the first place. Uh, as Paul says, for in Him, that is in Jesus Christ, all of His promises are yes and amen. Uh, his loving kindness is the reason why you have any love for Him at all, why you trust Him at all, why you obey Him at all. And it's on the basis of that loving kindness that you're asking for this help and He will give it to you. But again, you got to remember that you know, the, the obedience is the evidence that that loving kindness is really yours. And, and if you are disobeying, God's not going to deliver you from that suffering because it's come perhaps because of the disobedience. I, I hope we can see that distinction. So we need to obey to receive these blessings, but we need to remember at all times that our obedience stems from His loving kindness. And so we don't plead our righteousness and we don't plead our obedience alone, but we plead the loving kindness of the Lord we need to ask Him to deal with us in His grace and His mercy. Now, fourthly, I want us to see that, that your concern should always go beyond whether or not the Lord delivers you from your enemies because that's not all that's at stake here. You should also be concerned about how well you deport yourself, 
how well you behave, as it were, uh, in the middle of the trial. I want you to notice the psalmist was not concerned merely that God deliver him, but that in his sufferings that he honor the Lord. Look at verse 125. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. I mean, he was oppressed and he was asking God to deliver him. And yet in the middle of that, he says, I'm your servant. Help me to understand your testimonies. Why? So that he might honor the Lord, that he might obey him in the middle of the trial. You see, you want your life to reflect well on the Lord, whether in good times or in difficult times, but especially when you're going through difficulties. Because when you're going through difficulties, you have more people looking at you, uh, seeing how you're going to behave. And, of course, what you do is going to reflect more than upon the Lord, especially if you claim to be His. But how can you live in a way that is honoring to the Lord in difficult times unless you can also do it during the good times? I think you need to see yourself as the Lord's servants at all times. And you need to be praying at all times that He would give you understanding of His laws and give you a heart that is willing to obey Him. You know, sadly, there are so many who profess Christ today that seem to be more interested in seeing how much they can get away with, you know, how close they can get to the precipice, how close they can edge up to sin, and still convince themselves that they're really born again. Well... The Bible says you need to stay as far away from sin as you can and do as much as you can to please God. I mean, Jesus Christ is your example, isn't He? And how did Jesus live? Did did you see Jesus pushing the envelope? Did you see Him trying to get as close to the edge as He could without falling in? No. Jesus had one purpose and one goal in mind, and that was to do what was pleasing to the Father at all times. Well, that is the image that is being formed in you if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, and so that will be your heart as well. Not to get as close as you can to sin, but rather to be as pleasing as you possibly can uh, to the Lord. And again, it's important particularly that you seek to do that uh, when you are under a trial, and especially in the sight of your enemies as... um, Again, the psalmist had, has uh, frequently prayed that he would never give the enemies of the Lord an excuse to blaspheme God by the way that he lived. That's the way that we need to live, never giving anyone an excuse uh, to disregard the Lord or to think less of Him because of how we live. Now, the fact that you obey while your enemy uh, is oppressing you or doesn't obey is one of the main arguments that you can use why God should help you and judge them. Look at verse 126. It is time for the Lord to act, for they have broken your law. Now, we've seen why it is that the Lord should deliver you because you obey and, of course, because of His loving kindness. But why should the Lord take action against them? Why should the Lord judge them? Now, the psalmist doesn't say it's because they injured him or offended him, but that God should judge them because they've offended God. The reason why God should act is not because of what your enemies do to you, but because of what they do to him. I think that's an important distinction because when they injure you, they dishonor God, don't they? You are his servant. Lord, I am your servant. Look at what they are doing to your servant and judge them because they are actually attacking you. Lord, act for the glory of your name. At times like this, we should not focus our prayers on ourselves. I mean, what happens to us is is in, in a certain sense irrelevant because the Lord has the right to do with us what He will. He has the right to glorify His name through us however He will, but We need to realize at the same time, when somebody does something wrong to you, they are dishonoring Him. And that's the reason why God should act against them, is because of what they have done to Him and to His glory. 
So the psalmist doesn't focus his prayers on himself. He doesn't say, it is time for the Lord to act because they have, they have come against me, because they have offended me, but rather it's because they have broken your law in what they have done to me. His focus is not on himself, but his focus is on God's glory. They have broken his laws, and so the Lord should judge them. I think, again, that's a very important thing for us to see and should be one of our main arguments why the Lord should act for the glory of His name and not for our well-being. See, we, we so often put ourselves at the center, don't we? It's all about us, you know, uh, how comfortable we are, whether we're suffering or not or whether we're getting what we want, but we need to understand we're just servants. And the Lord is the Lord. All the focus should be on Him. If any glory comes to us, we should give it to Him. Uh, if we're oppressed, we should be concerned more for His glory and His name and, and that His laws are being broken than what is happening to us. As we place our focus on God and His glory, that's what honors Him. And that is when He will act. So let's put God at the center and not ourselves, because that's what everything is about. That's the reason why God created all that He did, why He made the world and everything in it, it was for His glory and His honor, not for our well-being. Our well-being is just, you might say, the consequence of God's desire to glorify Himself. So we need to be thankful that He attaches us to that plan in the way that He does and grants us all these blessings so that He might bring glory to His name. Now, the ungodly hate His laws and they break them, but the godly love them and keep them. If you are the Lord's, you will love them and you will keep them, as we've seen. But how much will you love the law of God? Well, how much did the psalmist love it? Verse 127, one of those passages we read actually in Psalm 19, "'Therefore I love your commandments above gold, yes, above fine gold.'" Not to keep them is to offend God, and that's the reason why he's pleading that God would, would judge those who have broken his law. But he, on the other hand, loves the law of God, and that is honoring to the Lord. They were precious to him, more precious to him than the most precious things on earth. And that's how precious they should be to you and to me. Now, how many of these commandments did he actually love? and considered to be precious. Well, it wasn't just some of them, and not just those that he already agreed with and wanted to do because they benefited him. Uh, it wasn't just, you know, he, he, well, it wasn't just those, we might say, that didn't get in the way of what it is he really wanted to do. Sometimes we pick and choose, and we can't do that. We need to love all of the commandments, and that's what he did. Notice verse 128. This was something that really stood out to me. He says, therefore, I esteem right all your precepts concerning everything. You know, he didn't pick and choose, but he loved them all, that God was right in everything he said. Everything was good. Everything was right. And what about those things that were contrary to the law of God? Well, he says, I hate every." false way. Now, this is important because, uh, as Jonathan Edwards has remind us, it reminded us before, um, to love God's law, truly to love it, means that we have to love all of it. If we, if we love righteousness, if we truly love righteousness, then we must, if we know the Lord Jesus Christ, then we will love all righteousness. Now, what happens if we, if we love 99% of it, but there's 1% of it that we don't love? Well, we love the 99% for some other reason than that it is righteous, because if we love righteousness, we would love it all the way across, okay? And that's just simply a more technical way of saying we can't pick and choose. If you love God, if you love His law, you're going to love all of it. And so here's a good diagnostic question to ask yourself. Do you love everything that God says is good and right. Are all of His words precious to you? 
uh, more precious than the things of this world? And do you hate everything that is contrary, that is against His will? Well, if that's true of you, then, then there will be two other things you might say that are true of you, or at least two things that will be consistent with that. First of all, you'll study the Bible to know what His will is. You know, when you love something, you go after it, don't you? You want to learn more about it. You delve into it, and you try to get as much of it as you can. If you love money, you try to get a lot of money. And if you love fame, you go after a lot of fame. Well, if you love God's law that's more precious to you than gold, then you will read the Bible and study it to try to understand what it is, what it is He wants you to do. Uh, not, not again to try to, to see if you can find loopholes in it, you know, to, to do what you want to do that's contrary to the will of God, but you will study it to know what is really pleasing to Him. And you will do it with prayer asking that God would help you to overcome your sin because your sin is going to want to try to find those loopholes, right? It's going to want to try to find a way to dodge around what it is that God is telling you to do so that you don't have to do it. You will study the Word of God prayerfully that the Lord would not only overcome your sin and subdue your flesh so that you can you know, actually see what God says, but also that He would open your eyes so that you could see that what He says really is good and something you should love. And then secondly, you will, by God's grace, try to live the kind of life that He calls you to live, the life He wants you to live, the life that He knows is best for you and best for others, no matter what the cost may be, even as we saw this morning, even if you have to suffer for it. And then if you do those two things, if you really love the, the, you know, the law and you've studied it and you, you see it, you know it, and you're seeking to live it, then when you do live it and you suffer for it, when you look to God for His promises, you will receive them. And even if you have to wait, God will eventually answer you in His timing. He will help you. He will deliver you. And you, you won't have to doubt that He will. Because you will have in your own life the evidence that you are His. I mean, not only the fact that you've trusted in Jesus Christ, but that you show that you're trusting in Him by turning from your sins and obeying Him, that you're seeking to obey Him in, in everything. Now, that basically sums up what it is we've seen this evening in this particular portion, and I, I hope we can all see how it applies to what we looked at this morning you know, we need to break through those barriers and get that gospel out to others, and suffering is definitely one of those barriers. But we do need to see here that the Lord is going to be with us in that suffering. He's not going to allow us to go beyond what we're able to endure. He's going to be with us to bless us, but we have to be obedient. And actually, if we're, if we're not, He will bring about the circumstances that will cause us to move in that direction anyway because He's faithful to do that. So we have to break through that suffering. We can do that, again, through care and concern. You know, sometimes our, our love for somebody is so strong that we will break through that, that fear of suffering, and we'll do it. We'll say, I care enough. I don't care what happens to me. I'm going to get this gospel to that person. We can break through that barrier perhaps by looking at suffering a little bit differently. It's not a bad thing. It's actually a privilege. It's granted to us by God. It's something He rewards, something that's the mark of a Christian. We can also look to God's promises and know again that He's going to be with us and that He is going to protect us because we love Him, we love His law, and we're seeking to do everything that is pleasing to Him. And knowing that God is going to be with you as you go out to evangelize as we kind of step out of our comfort zones and do things that we're not entirely comfortable with can be a great encouragement to us. God is our refuge, and you might say we don't have to run to Him. He's not in a fixed place somewhere where you have to go and stay in that one spot. He is with you wherever you go. He's sort of like a mobile fortress. You know, He is there. He is your refuge at all times. So may the Lord grant that these things we've seen in this passage would be true of each one of us this evening, and that it would help give us the boldness we need to break through those barriers and to be the witnesses that He wants us to be in this world.
Well, may the Lord apply His Word again to us uh, this evening as we need to hear it. Let's bow for a few moments of silent prayer and, and ask that He would encourage us to do so.